Well, good afternoon, everyone, and um, welcome to this evening's study. I know some of you are watching this the next day because of the time zone in which you live. And, and we're going to be looking at Jotham, who symbolizes the 70th week. And it's a very interesting story. We're going to go through this the best that we can. But before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we give our lives into your hands. We ask that you can use us in your kingdom to bring the truth to others, the knowledge of you to those around us. And Lord, we ask that your Holy Spirit can speak to us as we study together. We know that... Um, we struggle with this information, with this knowledge. Uh, partly it's intellectual and partly, Lord, this truth uh, cuts very deep. But we ask, Lord, that you can do your work upon our hearts, in our lives, that we can be changed. And that the trials that we face, Lord, will make us more dependent upon you. We ask that you can direct this study that you can correct us when we are in error and that we can understand these things that are presented. Be with us now through thy spirit, we pray and ask. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> so in the, the story of Gideon, it, it doesn't really end. He's a judge and um, he dies and so his work ends, but his sons continue on for a time. And we know there's part of the story of Gideon that we left out was Gideon's ephod. But we do know that the children of Israel return once again to false, uh, the worship of false gods. And then we have something here in this line that's a little bit different. We, we, we're going to have a story that's not about a judge. And it is about an enemy of sorts, but it's going to be one of the sons of Gideon, and that's going to be um, Abimelech. And Abimelech is an illegitimate son, and he's going to be made king. But Gideon also has 70 sons, and we heard of one of them in the last uh, study, Jether, who was the eldest, but we're going to learn about the youngest and this is Jotham. So it says in Judges 8, uh, 30, verse 30 to 31, And Gideon had threescore and ten sons of his body begotten, for he had many wives. And his concubine that was in Shechem, she also bare him a son, whose name he called Abimelech. Now, the story of Abimelech and Jotham, they're going to... Uh, Go in chapter 8 and chapter 9, so there's lots of different things. This is the end of chapter 8, and then all through chapter 9. Um, and then we can produce lots of different lines from this story. So the story of Gideon has lots of lines, and so does this story as well. And when we first had gone through it, we had noted this uh, story of Jotham's parable, but we hadn't drawn it on a line. And later when we went through it, we drew it on a line, and it became... I think one of the most profound parts of this story of Jotham. Now, the way that I looked at Jotham in trying to understand these lines um, is that we have in the line of the judges, we're going to have uh, Tola and Je'i, or the second angel arriving. They're going to parallel April 19th, 1844, the first disappointment. It's the second angel's message arriving in Millerite history. But Jotham and, and Abimelech, they sort of exist outside of that structure of the judges as far as one of the waymarks. They're not a waymark in the line. And the way that I see it is very similar to Samuel Snow. So we see a parallel between uh, Samuel Snow and Samuel Snow's letters, I guess, more specifically. So we understand that the work of Samuel Snow, he's the one who's going to Proclaim October 22, 1844, the seventh month movement in Millerite history. Miller 
his prophecies just go up to the spring of 1844, but Samuel Snow is going to take the studies of Miller and bring those and extend them to the fall. And in his letters, Samuel Snow's letters, they're going to start before the first disappointment and go past the first disappointment to this date, July 18, 1844. And so in order to understand this 70th week connected with Snow, what was the main teaching that Snow had that helped him understand October 22, 1844. What, was it, was it, what is it that he had to correct on the 1843 chart? It's not really on here, but it's, it's implied in Miller's understanding. What is it that Snow corrected? Anybody know? Okay, you got the mic there. <laughs> Hello. Yeah. Uh, so uh, Miller, he connected the end of the seventy weeks to the crucifixion of Christ. Thirty-three yeah. B and thirty-three A.D. Yep, thirty-three A.D. And Samuel Snow identified that Christ was crucified in the midst of the week, mm -hmm. and that would have been thirty-one. Right. So, so. We we'd often don't know this as Seventh-day Adventists. Uh, very few Adventists would know this. But the 70 weeks is going to end in 33 AD for Miller. And it's going to be at the end of the 70th week that he has Jesus' crucifixion. 40, 490 years to the day from the 12th day of the first month in 457. And he mistakenly believes that Jesus is crucified on the 12th day of the first month in 33 AD two days before the Passover, which of course is not the case. Uh, and it never seemed to be a criticism that his critics brought against him, which I find odd as well. But Samuel Snow recognized that Christ was crucified in the midst of the 70th week. So we can see how Jotham is being connected as the 70th son that survives this slaughter, as you will see. He becomes the 70th week. So... Um, what happens in 8, 33, and 35, it says, It came to pass, as soon as Gideon was dead, that the children of Israel turned again and went to whoring after Balaam and made Baal Bereth their god. Baal Bereth means the Lord of the Covenant or the Covenant of Baal because Bereth means uh, covenant. And the children of Israel remembered not the Lord their God who had delivered them out of the hands of all their enemies on every side. Neither showed they kindness to the house of Jeroboam, that is Gideon, according to all the goodness which he had shown unto Israel. Now, Jotham lines then covers a period of seven years. So I'm not going to go into that one too much because we have a line of Jotham. Um, and, and in that line, we, we will look at it, but I'm not going to go in detail. Now, he's the youngest of the 70, thus the 70th. He is also the only son to survive the slaughter of the 70 brothers by men that Abimelech hired. So in Judges 9, verse 1 to 5, And Abimelech, the son of Jeroboam, went to Shechem unto his mother's brethren and communed with them and with all the family of the house of his mother's father, saying, Speak, I pray you, in the ears of all the men of Shechem, whether it is better for you, either that all the sons of Jeroboam, which are threescore and ten persons, reign over you, or that one reigneth over you, or reigns over you. Remember also that I am your bone and your flesh. And his mother's brethren spake of him in the ears of all the men of Shechem, all these words, and their hearts inclined to follow Abimelech. For they said, He is our brother. And they gave him threescore and ten pieces of silver. So seventy pieces of silver out of the house of Baal Bareth, wherewith Abimelech hired vain and light persons. Uh, those are not good guys. Uh, which followed him. And he went unto his father's house in Oprah and slew his brethren, the sons of Jeroboam, being threescore and ten persons upon one stone, notwithstanding, yet Jotham, the youngest son of Jeroboam, was left, for he hid himself. So it always talks about that he slew 70. 
except one, right? It doesn't say he slew 69, but that is the case, right? Now, this seven years that uh, we noted there, we're going to take this as beginning December 21st, 2012 to November 9th, uh, 2019. Now, this is a history, of course, starting with the Mayan calendar, so it's going to be connected to that history. And, and each year we mark um, significant light that God had given to counteract the false time-setting message that will bring about the crisis of 11.9. So what we're taking is the message of Abimelech is the message that is left over from Parminder, this worship of Baal, this false worship that still exists in the movement and we're looking at this seven-year period prior to November 9th, 2019, in which messages are given to this movement regarding chronology, and it is this chronology that really exposes Parminder. <clears throat> so this is going to start with my presentations, and so I'm not going to go through this in detail, but I have here... Um, 777 days from October 5th to December 21st, which I've mentioned before in these studies. And we're taking Baal Bareth to be the darkness, to be this time setting of Parminders from 2012. And so in December of 2012, well, October, we have uh, this line upon line message given. And then it's going to proceed through these different uh, studies uh, that were given. Uh, at camp meetings, either in the United States or in Canada, um, that lead to uh, an understanding of symbols and time that's going to then come to a head on November 9th, 2019. Now, we also need to remember that Jotham, as a waymark in the line of the judges, is a line that's at the empowerment of the first angel's message. Tola and Jair, I shouldn't say it, it's there. It's after that empowerment because Tola and Jair are the arrival of the second angel's message. And Jotham is going to be in that period after the empowerment. So I'm going to have to draw this out so you can understand this. So one of the problems that we had, Jeff and I, when we were looking at Samuel Snow's letters back in 2018, is we knew that we had April 19th, 1844, as uh, the first day, first month, right? And Samuel Snow's letters begin before the first day of the first month, and the previous waymark in this history, if this is the arrival of the second angel, the previous waymark in this history is August 11th, 1844, or 1840, pardon me. August 11th, 1840. So this is Islam. And so this is the first angel empowered. So Samuel Snow is coming after this. And then he's going to have this message that's going to go. So we'll just call this Snow. Now, all of his letters, I mean, there are some letters in 1842 and 1843. And then in 1844, he, he does his personal testimony on December 1st, 1843, at the Boston Tabernacle, where he's later going to give the midnight cry on a July 21st, 1844. And it's going to be the day after, January 1st, so the first day of the first month, that he's going to begin presenting his message. He decides, I'm going to be telling people that Jesus is not returning in the spring, but in the fall, that the types point to the fall. And so he begins his study, and he's going to write these series of letters. But they occur before here. Now, we have the position, well, this is 9-11, right? 9-11 with, you know, midnight, midnight cry, and then the Sunday law, right? This is how Jeff understands this, you know, Boston, Exeter, and the great disappointment. And he puts creates this line. So we've gone through this. But this is 9-11, and this is where uh, we can see that this is also 9-11, right? 
So that means there is a 9-11 in, now this is August 11th, 1840, but this is the empowerment of the first angel. Now in our history, we bring these two together. We're just saying it's one event, 9-11. But we've come to understand that this relates to 11-9, 2019 as well, when it's the arrival of the second angel. But this was the, the struggle that we had. And this is where we're placing um, um, uh, Jotham. We're placing him in this history. Tola and Jair are here. Um, you know, you're going to have uh, Gideon over here, and then you're going to have his son, his 70th son, Jotham. And we know that Snow, in Samuel Snow's letters, he's going to have a structure, and, and that structure is going to be like this. I know it's not proportional, but he's going to have this date, May 2nd, uh, 1844, that's going to be halfway between July 18th, 1844, and when his first, I'll do it like this, his first letter is published. It's going to look a little more proportional. So this is Snow's letters, we'll call that. And, and this is going to be February 16th. And if you take February 16th as two months, 16 days, second month, the 16th day, this distance here is two months and 16 days, and this is two months and 16 days, right? And so this is the center, and this is his Passover. This is the true Passover. And his topic is going to be the cross in the midst of the week. Right? So that's going to be his message. So we can see how that is important. So I'm not going to go through this, this whole part of, of that line, of Jotham's line. But I'm, I'm just trying to show you that Jotham represents that history. He represents Ezekiel because snow re is represented by Ezekiel because Ezekiel begins prophesying on the fifth day of the fourth month, midnight. So he's connected to the message of Samuel Snow. Right, Samuel Snow is going to be there at midnight. And he also lies on his left side for 390 days and then his right side for 40 days, Ezekiel does. And when he begins lying on his right side, it's going to be August 15th, the midnight cry. So you can see that Snow and Ezekiel are together and Jotham is paralleling that history. But we know we are paralleling that history, and this is illustrated in this story of Jotham. So we had Jotham's line, and then we have Jotham's parable. Now, um, in Jotham's line, there's, uh, I want you to turn, if, if you have your notes, the last page that I have uh, regarding Jotham. And I'm going to have this chart this chart is going to be uh, the seven years and 777 days put together in a single line. And uh, that line is, is going to address 3,291 days. It's actually the 777 chiasm. Um, but I'm not going to look at that, but it's, it's there for people to look at. There are studies in which I address this. Um, but Jotham's line and Jotham's par parable bring together this whole history. And uh, so it's speaking to this movement. But we, we can accept that God has given us chronology to counteract Parminder. Now, we're going to have uh, another line. So we're going to have... Uh, Joth uh, Jotham's uh, parable, and Jotham's parable is interesting. But what we end up doing is we end up looking at another line, Abimelech's downfall. So we have all of these lines and probably more, but Abimelech's downfall is, is addressing the fourth way mark in Jotham's parable. So we need to go through that, and then we're going to look at, at this uh, downfall of Abimelech. Now here in these lines, one of the things that we discovered when we were studying this. So remember, we had, when we got to the book of Judges, uh, we studied the beginning and then we went to the end because the end, the last four or five chapters, whatever there are, 
16, 17, 18. I think there's four chapters at the end, maybe five. Uh, but they, they're actually stories that are at the beginning of Judges. And so we studied that at the beginning. We studied the end of Judges at the beginning. And then we went back and we started going through Judges. And we went through Judges three times. So all of the Judges we went through studying line upon line, uh, more and more detailed each time. And, and so we, we began to be able to understand these stories. Um, I don't remember everything that we studied, but we have all of this detail, and, and then we could put it into lines. We could sort it out. So at first, it looked like confusion, as Stephen talked about in his Wheels Within Wheels, uh, Ezekiel's message. So you can see how we're going to have the same problem with all of these lines. They're going to look very complex until we can sort them out. Now, Jotham's parable um, employs a 3-1 combination. That is, what's going to happen in this story is that Abimelech is going to be made king. And so we're going to turn to chapter 9 of Judges. And the first thing we know is that when we look at chapter 9, is, is the killing of all these 70 sons of Gideon, except one. And then it says in verse 6 of chapter 9, And all the men of Shechem gathered together, and all the house of Milo, and went and made Abimelech king by the plain of the pillar that was in Shechem. And we spent a lot of time understanding this. One, we went through the story of uh, the blessings and the curses. The Mount of Blessing is Gerizim. The Mount of Curses is Ebal. And prior to crossing the Jordan River, prior to Moses' um, Moses' death, he's going to uh, tell them that when you get into the land, you're going to go to these mountains and you're going to make a covenant with God. And, and, and this is the covenant, really, of Leviticus 26, but it's also Deuteronomy 28. And he tells them what's going to happen, how they're going to divide up the tribes, which tribes are going to be on what mountain. And, and this is, um, these blessings and curses are being read, and the people uh, who are in the valley, the priests, uh, they're in the valley by Shechem, right? And there's a pillar going to be set up. So this is a covenant that is made. Now, Joshua is going to renew that covenant again at Shechem before he dies, but Abimelech, when he wants to be made king, he's going to go to Shechem. One is it's the men of Shechem. That's the area where Abimelech is. So there's going to be a counterfeit covenant. We have Baal Beret, which means a covenant, right? And we're going to have this covenant as well. Now, if we understand it, there is a true covenant, the covenant week, so when we look at the week of Christ, it's the covenant week, right? Because he's going to confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week, he shall cause sacrifice and oblation to cease. Now, I'm going to do a presentation on the midst of the week, and I'm going to address that a bit more, because we also have a counterfeit covenant week, and that's the two 1260s for paganism and papalism, right? So they, that's Satan's counterfeit 2520, so to speak, for northern Israel. Okay? So this, this is happening here, this counterfeit. Now, it says in verse 7, And when they told it to Jotham, he went and stood in the top of Mount Gerizim, and lifted up his voice and cried and said unto them, Hearken unto me, ye men of Shechem, that God may hearken unto you. The trees went forth on a time to anoint a king over them, and they said unto the olive tree, Reign thou over us. But the olive tree said unto them, Should I leave my fatness, wherewith by me they honor God and man, and go to be promoted over the trees? That's the work of the Holy Spirit, the olive. Right? So we line that up, the olive, with November 9th. So I have to raise this. We'll draw out this line. So this, this is actually a simple line. Uh, it, there's not much that complicates it. So 
So you have here November 9th, right? And we're going to say that this is the olive. And, you know, we could look at the verses that are here. Uh, this is going to be, um, uh, well, I think it's which verse? It's um, verses nine, uh, 8 and 9, right? So, so it's chapter 9, verses 8 and 9. That's going to be the olive. And so this is a message. We know that September 11th, it's the work of the Holy Spirit. We saw in, in some of the Othniel. But now we see here 11.9 is also this work of the Holy Spirit. Now, the trees in this parable are referring to people in some ways, right? Some kind of people are wanting this message to reign over them. But the message itself doesn't want to reign over them. Why is that? What is it that people want from November 9th, 2019? They want a leader, someone to follow. Okay, but what was it that they were looking for on November 9th? The close of probation. They were looking for vindication. They didn't want to sin anymore, but not by overcoming sin. They wanted something magical to happen to them. So they figured if they, if they couldn't... If they somehow could not sin for a period of time, when then when November 9th came, they would be sealed in that not sinning. And then they would have it easy, yeah. right? They were trying to win the spiritual lottery with November 9th. Now, when I listened to the studies where people were sharing these ideas, I didn't connect that with Parminder originally. I just thought, these people are pretty fanatical. You know, they're following Parminder, maybe... Maybe, you know, Parminder should correct them. But that was actually the fruit of Parminder's teaching, right? So they wanted to win the spiritual lottery. They wanted to be this perfect church, the church triumphant that could just win the spiritual lottery so that they didn't have to worry about anything. They didn't have to fight that battle. Now, the 144,000, when their probation closes, do they know that it's closed? Do they see themselves as righteous all of a sudden? No. No. Does that battle with self end? No. It gets more and more intense. They're going to be victorious because the more you are like Christ, the more intense that battle with self. Correct? Amen. So so that's what the, the olive is. It's this November 9th, the work of the Holy Spirit the overcoming of sin, but they want that to reign over them. And then um, what we look at with November 9th is um, some of the symbols that are, are there are Lamech, right? Because Abimelech, um, we looked at some of these numbers connected with him. It's in, uh, we don't know, 1260 BC was a date we had. I don't know if that's correct, but I think that's what you had, right? For Abimelech. As a right. consequence, yeah, so Stephen needs to turn on his microphone, and the mic's there, yeah. Yes, if we have the 300 years of uh, Jephthah yeah. going to 1194 BC, yeah. you just go back to Er, Tola, uh, the Ammonites. Yeah. Whatever and so forth, that will take you to 1260 BC. Yeah, so, so we're um, kind of accepting that, right? That's yeah, and I think there is a connection with the papacy in that date as well, because you have Abimelech being the, like, the first king of Israel in a sense, yeah. but, but he's like a usurper. Yes. A sort of internal king yeah. coming up from amongst them, and then mm -hmm. I think very similar with the beginning of the 1260 years. Yeah. So you have there a date and a span. Mm-hmm. And I, I can maybe go into that tomorrow. Yeah. Now, I, I present, as I've told before, on November 9th in 2019 at the School of the Prophets, I, I present some message regarding um, uh, the Mayan calendar and so forth. Now, I'm going to write Jeff on April 26th an email listing out why I think it's possible July 18th is going to be a failed prediction because it's on this line of failed predictions. So I place that April 26th um, 
2020 as the formalization of this message. And, and that, of course, is um, uh, then going to lead to the empowerment because the Mayan calendar prediction that I send him points to July 10th. And that's the um, July 10th is a symbol of the 10th day of the seventh month. And on July 11th, Jeff presents his last presentation to this movement, right? So July 11th, so it's July 11th and 10th. And that's going to be 9 verse 6. So we have the Mayan calendar in the 273, and, and that's what happens with the Mayan calendar. It creates this 273 that points to July 10th. So that's, that's the message of the olive. And, and so the olive gives a message that really undoes or shows the undoing of that false message. And then we're going to have uh, the fig. So, but the fig tree said unto them, should I forsake, no, in verse 10, and the tree said unto the fig, come thou and reign over us. But the fig said unto them, should I forsake my sweetness? and my good fruit, and go to be promoted over the trees. So we have this prediction, which is sweet in the mouth, but bitter in the belly, Belly, right? So that's the fig. So people, what are they looking for there is not the overcoming of sin, but they're looking for the vindication. That's July 18th. That's the fig, right? They want to have this fruit of righteousness, um, but they don't want to do the work of changing their lives. And so that's the fig. They want the vindication. They want the praise of people. They want, they want their friends to be now vindicated so their friends will come into the message. And, and one of the problems is when it fails, many people are embarrassed. Now I told my friends and they're not going to listen to anything I say ever again. Right? And that, that's the problem of the fig. So, but the fig is not going to reign over them, right? This is a true message. And, and that's in 9 verse 11. So even though we put it at July 18th, it's ending that message of 9-11 or 11-9. And then that's going to be formalized on March 27th, 2021. Now, we put that there. Um, um, I'm trying to remember that, um, why I did that. There was a reason. Oh, it's connected with the Levitical chiasm. That's why. So nothing happens on that date. And then we're going to have April 26th again. April 26, 2021 is the empowerment of this message being the Mayan date 130666, or not 6, 888, pardon me. The third message arrives on December uh, 2025. So we're going to have, I need to draw this out. So we have here April... 26th, that's going to be the email to Jeff, the failed prediction, which comes from the Mayan calendar. And then we're going to have <clears throat> um, yes, July 10th, right? So that's all dealing with, you know, the 273. This is where it's going to be uh, 273, that's where this Mayan date comes from, July 10th, and we put 11th there as well, so that's marking the end of July 10th and into July 11th when Jeff gives his last message, so you've got the first angel arrives, the first angel is formalized, and the first angel is empowered, and then you have July 18th, and that's going to be the second angel arriving, and you know, as we noted, this is, um, it's in 9 verse 11, so it's connected to 9-11, and that's connected to 9-11 by 252 days. Um, and then we're going to have this March 27th, 2021 date. That's going to be the second angel formalized. It's the end of the Levitical uh, chiastic structure. It, it points to that, to this March 27th date. And this is going to be 252 days. So you got here, 
uh, from here to here, 252 days. And then you're going to have, again, another 252 days. Right? So that's uh, this date. And that's going to be, uh, I didn't put the verse, which verse it is, but it's, it's connected to that story of the fig. And then we have April 26th. Twenty twenty one, and this is the Mayan date, so thirteen decimal, eight, 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 and this goes all the way back to this Mayan uh, calendar understanding. <clears throat> so we get April twenty sixth, twenty twenty one, and um, so uh, where is this here? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then the third message arrives December 25th, 2021. So you just got So this is going to be uh, the, um, the vine, right? So you got the vine here, and I should have put the fig here. But then we're going to have the bramble, right? And so the bramble lies in what we call the fourth angel arrives. So in these lines, we have this, uh, this bramble, the fourth angel arriving. And that's the thing uh, that we're interested in. The bramble is going to be about Abimelech's downfall. Now, one of the things I want to note is we have with this 777 chiasm, I'm just going to draw it up here, where you start on that Mayan date, uh, 13 decimal... Zero, 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 right? So that's 1,872,000 days from when the Mayan calendar begins. That's going to be uh, December 21st, 2012, right? And that's going to be to December 25th, 2021, 3,291 days. And this 329 is part of the Levitical chiasm. It's the number of days between October 13th, 2018, and September 7th, 2019. So this is 10 times that plus 1. And this ends December 25th, 2021, right? So those are those two dates. Now, <clears throat> when we look at the bramble... So the bramble is the arrival of the fourth message. It's Abimelech's downfall. And the word bramble in Hebrew is the number 329, right? So Hebrew 329 is bramble. It's also a thorn, right? So that is 329 is this bramble, and that's going to be the symbol that's dealing with Abimelech. He's the bramble, and he's going to be made king over them, right? The trees are going to make him king over them. Okay, so we can see that this, this is significant, this 329 in this context. Now, we're, we're looking at the bramble for a reason, um, because we believe that we're in the midst of this at the present time, and that... This is a line that's unfinished. That is, it's referring to events in the future. Now, we're not predicting a date in the future. We're just saying that this movement is moving to an experience that is going to be represented in the future, and we don't know when that is. We don't know what event it's talking about. So we're not predicting an event. We're just saying we're in the midst of Abimelech's downfall. In, we're in Jotham's parable, and there's a message to us that we need to understand. So, I'm going to erase this, and we're going to look at the bramble. Now, the bramble is, you know, as I said, it's something that re relates to something in the future. But it brings together some symbols um, that are very powerful. And we're going to look at these. 
and I'm going to draw this out first. So <clears throat> we have this period of darkness. It's going to be at the beginning of this line. So what is the darkness with this bramble? What would the darkness possibly be? Okay, well, we're going to read a little bit about uh, Abimelech, right? So we need to understand his character. So we know that there, he's being made king. And in the parable, um, uh, Jotham is going to say this. Then said all the trees unto the bramble, Come thou and reign over us. And the bramble said unto the trees, If in truth ye anoint me king over you, then come and put your trust in my shadow. Now, you can't get much shadow from a thorny shrub, right? And if not, let fire come out of the bramble and devour the cedars of Lebanon. So these trees are the cedars of Lebanon. Now, therefore, if ye have done truly and sincerely in that ye have made Abimelech king, and if ye have dwelt well with Jeroboam in his house and have done unto him according to the deserving of his hands, so this is Jotham saying this, for my father fought for you and adventured his life far and delivered you out of the hand of Midian. And, and we didn't note that Midian is strife, and we believe that this has to do with strife in this movement. And ye are risen up against my father's house this day and have slain his sons, threescore and ten persons, upon one stone. So what has been attacked by Abimelech? Dwight. The entire house, the entire heritage of Jerusalem. Okay, but you presented this morning about the 70 weeks, Correct. right? Correct. So, so if the 70 sons are the 70 weeks, that means the 70 weeks are being attacked right. in this movement, right? In some way. They have they, yeah. So, and, and we need to understand what that means because people aren't openly attacking the 70 weeks. But there's something about the 70 weeks that they are attacking, right? So you've, lain, you've slain three score and ten persons upon one stone. Now, of course, we know that Jotham was not killed. The 70th week still survives. That's the thing that's going to be the witness to this movement of the power of God leading, right? Now, we can also say, in some ways, the 70 weeks is represented by Lamech, right? And that's July 18th. So we can also say that the way that the 70 weeks are being attacked is the attack upon July 18th, 2020. Because Lamech, if we take the letters of his name and multiply them, and of course Lamech lived for 777 years, right? But if we take the letters of his name and multiply them, they, we get 18720. That's the 18th of July, 2020. That's the main symbol we have for July 18, 2020. Those the letters, especially in that order. So we have here, um, that's what the 70 weeks are about. They're about Lamech. And so those how, are how they're being attacked in this movement is by undermining that teach, teaching. But we have this 70th week that's going to stand up against Abimelech and give this parable, right? So he says, If ye have dealt truly and sincerely with Jeroboam and with his house this day, then rejoice ye in Abimelech, and let him also rejoice in you. But if not, let fire come out from Abimelech and devour the men of Shechem and the house of Milo, and let fire come from the men of Shechem and from the house of Milo and devour Abimelech. And Jotham ran, Jotham ran away and fled and went to Beer and dwelt there for fear of Abimelech, his brother. Beer means a well, right? So Jotham is studying in this well, right? It doesn't say a Beersheba, the well of the oath, but and we don't think it's the same place, but at least it's symbolically connected. And so he gives this prophecy about what's going to happen to the men of Shechem if they follow Abimelech. And I believe that people in this movement, and I'm not trying to say this to be hard, but they're following Abimelech. They've made Abimelech king. And so this is a spirit that Abimelech has 
in how he attacks the message. So the division that's in this movement is Abimelech. Now, we're not saying that it's those people over there, they're Abimelech, right? We're saying that this applies to all of us. We all have this spirit, and the 70th week is given to us to witness against us. Now, we get into an interesting part of this story, but before I get there, I just want to write out these dates. So we take this, this line beginning on December 25th, 2021. So this line is the fourth angel arriving there. And, and this darkness here has to do with, with the spirit, right? So this darkness, we, we could say it's the spirit of envy. Does that make sense to people? Because isn't really that what Abimelech is, envious? This spirit of envy exists in us. But on December 25th, a first message arrives. Now, this is that conflict that occurs on December 25th, the 20th day of the ninth month, right? And this is in nine, verse 9, or chapter 9, verse 20, right? And then we're going to have these 49 days, and that's going to bring us to, and we're going to still use 9, verse 20, right? Because this is the 20th day of the ninth month. But we have this Pentecost connecting here to Odilio's study, February 12th, 2022. And we're going to say that's the formalization of this. <clears throat> so a message is coming to this people at this time to address the problems that we have in us. Now, this is going to be empowered on December 25th, Twenty twenty two. This is when we're going to start the study of the lines simply presented. Now, really, on December twenty fourth, there's an invitation made to them, but December twenty fifth, twenty twenty two, is the first day of the tenth month. On the biblical calendar, right? So remember, this one's the twentieth day of the ninth month, right? And this is going to be the first day of the 10th month, this date. So December 25th, 21 is the 20th day of the ninth month. So 20th verse, uh, ninth chapter is going to represent that. And this is just continuation of that. These two are connected. Um, now, uh, December 25th, 2021, we're going to connect uh, another date here, 2022, pardon me, the second angel arriving. And here we're putting the end of Colin's study, which he doesn't give this date, but this date is suggested in his study. It needs to in order to finish the prophetic mirror. It needs to end there. And this date symbolically is the first day of the 10th month, right? Because we have a date over here, the third angel arriving, that is April 5th, 2030, I guess I could have put it down here. And that date is from the first day of the 10th month in the story of Ezra, right? In Ezra 10, you have this um, 88 days from the first day of the 10th month to the first day of the first month. Right? That's the divorce. According to the law. And 88 days, if we take a day for a month, this is the span of time between these two dates, is 2,640. That's 88 times 30. Right? So we have these, this date over here in the future, which we have no idea what it means other than a symbol. And we've connected it in different ways, and we're going to look at that in a lot more detail. But we have here these two first days of the 10th month. The, the, so they're tied together, but it's, it's the end of this prediction uh, that we mark. Now, 
Remember, in our lines, we have two 9-11s, right? Jeff would put 9-11 as the empowerment of the first angel. That's August 11th, 1840, paralleling 9-11. And 9-11 is also the arrival of the second angel, right? So we can look at this and we can say, well, this is also 9-11, right? Right, so these are both 9-11, so I was drawing Jeff's line up there. But, but we can put them here because this is the empowerment and the arrival. And we can say that this is August 11th, 1840. And this is April 19th, 1844. Okay, that makes sense. Now, between these two dates, in so we know the number of days between um, August 11th, 1840 and October 22, 1844, right? 1533 days, okay? But here we have a number. Um, it's 1347 days. And 1347 days relates to Jotham. Jotham, as a name, as a Hebrew word, is H3147. So all that's switched around is the 13. The 13 switched around to a 31. Now, we had done this earlier in one of the other comparisons um, when we were dealing with... Uh, the name of Barak, right? He's 1301. And then we had another name, which just escapes me, um, which was 3101. So they were inverted. The 13 and the 31 were inverted. I'm trying to find that here. It's, it's in the notes. You may be able to find that somewhere. That was in the study earlier um, this morning. So, let me just see if I can quickly find it. I probably can't. Um, yes, it's Joash. Gideon's the son of Joash. And so, Joash and Barak have that, the same uh, letters. So, the 3101 is Joash and 1301 is Barak. So, so, we can do this. Now, we're going to see this more when we get into Jephthah, the significance of this. Um. We're going to understand a bit more about these Hebrew numbers and these iterations of, of numbers and what they mean. So we can see that Jotham here is, this is representing the message of Jotham. Okay? He's connected to this first day of the 10th month. Now, when we look at the symbol of the divorcement, as people who are caught up in all of these things that are happening in the movement, the temptation is to say, well, those people are divorcing us. But this isn't about people. It's about a message, correct? Yes. And we need to divorce from the strange wives. And the strange wives represent what? In unpure character. Well, in a it, well, in a sense, but it's, it's related to how we study God's word. Right? The Protestant methods of Bible study. Correct. And God has given us Miller's rules, which we acknowledge. But he's given us more than Miller's rules. They come out of Miller's rules. We've been given line upon line. When we, when we give our message here, it's, there's nothing wrong with putting dates and seeing these structures. But in order to understand them correctly, we need to place them upon a line. We need to have the scriptures guide us in those lines, and we need to see those parallels to our history. We can be misled with Gideon's ephod. Right? Correct. We can, we can use the chronology in an incorrect way to start predicting events in the future, and it just becomes a snare unto us. This chronology can become a snare if it's used incorrectly. And Now, I'm not the judge of what's correct and what's not correct. But I do know 
I read the things that people place on WhatsApp and Facebook, and I see people using the chronology incorrectly. Now, sometimes they're partially correct. The dates are correct, but they interpret it without the line upon line structure, without the biblical narrative to guide them. And if we do that, we will mislead ourselves in what those lines mean, right? That is the big problem that we write, have right now in this movement, that we don't understand how to use these lines. And God has been giving us this understanding. Now, when we look at these lines then, we're going to have um, ga'al. We're going to have two-way marks here. Now, this name is actually a choking sound, right? That's what it, it is. It's the choking you get from bitterness. Uh, I still remember uh, my son, Micah. Uh, we, we went to some health food store, and this guy was just starting up this health food store, and he had made some um, uh, tahini from sesame seeds that were unhauled. <laughs> Now, my son, Micah, does not eat tahini to this day because of that experience. Um, I mean, he gagged. <laughs> but that is this bitterness. Now, I'm not sure what this bitterness is, but I think, I believe, that it is a response to recognizing the bitterness of sin in our lives. That we're going to recognize what we have done wrong and we are going to, instead of having honey in the mouth that's sweet, we're going to have some tahini in the mouth that is really bitter. right? We're going to have to eat some bitter herbs. Um, so that's how I look at Gaal. But we don't have a date here because I believe that this is future. That we, we, can't, we, can't, we don't know what this is even, really, as far as an experience or an event or or whatever, it's just something that's here, right? That we have to face. And then we also have um, uh, Zebel. Now Zebel is, um, these are these people who are, um, in the story of Abimelech, they're, they're fighting with Abimelech or for him, right? There's, there's different things happening. So I'm not sure what Zebel is. I mean, he's the, the mayor of the city, right? That's, and that's in 9, verse 31 to 33. But he represents something that we don't yet understand. So this is a study that we need to look at. But Abimelech, that king that we have reigning over us, in our spirits, in that the way that we treat one another, that has to be defeated. Abimelech needs to, we need to see his downfall in order for us to understand the truth. And I would think that Gaal and Zebul represent that experience in some way. I don't know how. We could look at those those symbols and and try to to interpret them or understand them. So as we progress in these studies, remember these studies are not about numbers and intellect. We have an experience in this world that is very, very painful. And and God is trying to speak to us. He's trying to correct us. He's trying to help us as individuals, and as a movement. And so we need to, to trust in this work that he is doing. So can you join me in prayer? <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, we are thankful, Lord, for this day, in spite of some of the sorrows that we experience the heartache, the pain. And Lord, we know 
that it's better to go to the house of mourning than to the house of feasting. But it's difficult. And this Christian walk is a difficult thing. We seek to carry that cross, the cross of Christ. We are thankful, Lord, for what Jesus has done for us in the midst of the week. And we pray here as we are on Wednesday in the midst of this week that you can accept our confession of our sins, that you can take our lives, and that you can mold them and renew them. We pray for the rest of these studies. We know, Lord, there's many things on our hearts that, that try to draw us away from the message you want to give us. We know we are feeble, but we need you, Lord, each one of us. I pray for each person hearing these messages. I pray that you can accept us in the beloved and that you can complete the work that you began in us, in Christ Jesus. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.